Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar today. My name is Cosme Radu. I'm the webinars manager here at Bitdefender and it's my pleasure to welcome Livio Arsini for today's presentation. Before we start, please note that you are muted as we are recording this webinar. You are going to receive access to the recording through a follow-up email that will go out within uh, the next couple of days. Throughout this session, as you are muted, we encourage you to use the chat and submit any questions that you might have, as we are going to host a Q&A session at the end of Livio's presentation. And now, leave you over to you. Hi, Kasmin, um, and hi, everyone, and thanks for joining our um, 2019 Evolving Threat Landscape and How It Affects Your Organization uh, webinar. Uh, my name is Livio Rossini. I'm a global uh, cybersecurity researcher, and I guess I will be your host for the next 30 to uh, 45 minutes, uh, depending on how long uh, I plan to, you know, diverge from the, from the matter at hand. Uh, for any questions you may have, don't hesitate to write them down uh, during the session. As uh, as Cosmin mentioned, uh, we'll also have a Q&A session at the end where, where um, I'll try to address as many of these questions as possible. Um, well, uh, I, I think I should probably start by saying something a little bit about myself and my role in Bitdefender. Uh, I've been in the IT industry for uh, over a decade now. I've spent close to uh, eight years in the security industry with Bitdefender. And uh, currently, uh, my main focus is uh, reporting on malware outbreaks and security incidents while at the same time coordinating um, with technical and research uh, departments, hence this threat landscape report. Um, I've also been closely working and interfacing with um, cross-company development teams uh, because uh, my past role of a technologies product manager involved pretty much understanding Bitdefender's entire uh, technology stack. And last but not least, uh, since this is November and um, it's the Cyber Awareness, Cybersecurity Awareness Month, uh, I guess this webinar fits in nicely in that uh, overall theme. Uh, I guess what better timing to talk about the threat landscape than that, right? Okay. So uh, with that out of the way, here's what we're going to be talking about. Uh, since this is a threat landscape report, we're going to be covering uh, topics ranging from vulnerabilities to specific threats that have um, that we've seen evolving over the past couple of years and during the first half of 2019. Uh, we'll also cover the IoT segment, specifically the uh, from the industrial perspective. Um, I'll share a couple of, of stats about that, stats that are coming uh, directly from our own telemetry. And we'll finish off with uh, what are some of the biggest concerns for SMBs and uh, MSPs. Now, before we get started, I just want to mention that uh, some of the stats that I'm about to disclose will be available in a report that we're going to uh, we're going to publish in the following days. Um, however, some of the information and stats presented in this webinar might not make it in the final version of that report. Uh, mostly because I just wanted to make uh, this webinar a little bit more interesting for you guys. So uh, I know there's going to be a lot of stats, a lot of percentages and numbers. So um, I guess my, my only advice is just, you know, uh, this is going to be a one-time opportunity, opportunity to get more insights than the report that we're going to be publishing in the, in the next couple of days and the report that you're going to re uh, receive. Now, uh, no organization um, is actually impervious to, impervious to a, uh, a data breach. Uh, but by uh, understanding how both cybersecurity professionals and um, IT departments actually view risk, uh, we need to identify and understand the weak spots uh, both on, on organizational and individual level. Now, consequently, we recently commissioned a survey on more than uh, 6,000 InfoSec professionals, if I'm not mistaken, uh, InfoSec professionals in large organizations across the U.S., EMEA, and um, even APAC regions, which revealed, um, amongst others, that about 49% of security professionals actually lose sleep worrying about their organization's cybersecurity. Now, this is not something new. Probably a lot of you that work in cybersecurity already know this, and probably half of you already lose sleep about this. Now, a large portion of, um, of them, of these cybersecurity professionals, actually believe that the best way of defeating against advanced attacks is to provide training and support. Of course, this is provided by the fact that organizations um, which are you know, placing more emphasis on training are better at detecting attacks quickly and more efficient at isolating them. Now, ultimately, I guess cybersecurity has improved over the last 36 months, but IT workers um, are still facing a great deal of stress and risk. Uh, I guess this means that 
you know, getting the right strategies and solutions in place is actually uh, imperative. Now, that said, we also learned from the same survey that about 57% of companies have experienced a breach uh, in either uh, 2017, 2018, or 2019. And um, about 24% of companies have already suffered a data breach halfway through 2019. And lastly, uh, about 36% of companies who haven't suffered a cyber attack actually believe that it is, li it is likely uh, that they are currently facing one without even knowing about it. Now, hopefully, um, our threat landscape report will, will probably give you some insights on how some of the, those breaches uh, occur or might occur. Uh, so let's start by looking at vulnerabilities and how they've evolved in 2019 so far. Uh, while vulnerabilities come in all si uh, shapes and sizes uh, in terms of impact and severity, uh, there have also been reports of hardware vulnerabilities for which mitigation might not necessarily be uh, possible. If you've uh, watched our previous threat landscape reports that uh, we did uh, you know, in 2018, specifically the H1 and H2 report, you probably know that the analyzing vulnerabilities is something that we do and something that we kickstart these uh, threat landscape reports with. Okay, so uh, if we are to compare the year-over-year -year evolution of the uh, number of reported vulnerabilities, around 25% of all vulnerabilities reported in 2000, 2019, I mean, the first half of 2019, were actually tagged as high and critical uh, with a CVE score of above seven. Now, as the chart you know, uh, indicates, the total number of vulnerabilities uh, reporting during each month of, month of 2019 is actually higher than those reporting during the uh, same time frame in 2018. Of course, the only exception being February and March 2019, where um, it seems that security researchers either took a break or the um, negotiated uh, disclosure policy was potentially longer than usual. You know, they found a vulnerability in December and January, and instead of publishing it in February or March, they decided to go after, um, after April. That's probably why there's an April uh, spike into April spike and the number of reported vulnerabilities. Um, on the same topic, I'm not sure if any of you um, have learned uh, yet, but Bitdefender has been appointed um, as a CV numbering authority in partnership with uh, Mitri. Uh, this means that we are authorized to assign CV IDs to vulnerabilities affecting products, um, uh, affecting any product, and we have now uh, become the primary point of contact for actually receiving reports of vulnerabilities discovered in our own product line as well. So this means that in our next landscape report, um, hopefully we'll um, come forward with some stats uh, of our own regarding the most commonly reported vulnerabilities and we'll also be able to better track down how these have actually evolved um, over time. Now that said, uh, in terms of which vendors, um, in terms of which vendors have had the most number of critical vulnerabilities reported uh, within their products and services, uh, Microsoft takes the lead with 33% uh, 30, 30, of vulnerabilities uh, that have been tagged as critical, uh, with a CVE score of about uh, of above nine. Uh, Google came in second with 25% of CVEs ranked as critical with the ACVs for about uh, above nine and Apple with 22%. Now, uh, to some extent, these numbers actually make sense um, because these are some of the biggest software and service providers. So uh, who also happen to own some of the largest market share in their respective fields, which basically makes them a target for security researchers and uh, even hackers, why not? Uh, now, these stats actually um, are actually a pretty good indicator into understanding which of your infrastructure services and products are most commonly targeted by threat actors. Um, and if you will, a reminder that you need to have a patching policy in place that reduces the time of vulnerability exposure. Now, some organizations use uh, automated tools to, create, uh, to take care of that. Uh, some have internal procedures that they run on a regular basis. Um, but the point is that the attack surface can sometimes be pretty wide if patching is not a priority, and this puts a lot of pressure on IT and security teams, and even security tools for that matter, um, in terms of accurately identifying and preventing potential, uh, potential breaches. Um, hardware vulnerabilities, on the other hand, are an entirely new beast. Uh, if software can be patched, 
at least to some extent. A hardware vulnerability means that you either need to come up with some mitigation tactic or rip the vulnerable hardware from your infrastructure and replace it with new one. Now, sadly, the latter is not always an option, especially since there might not be anything to replace it with. Uh, at Bitdefender, we recently found a new hardware design vulnerability in Intel chips um, affecting CPUs going back to 2012. Um, the attack pretty much builds on previous research, which led to the, um, uh, the popular Spectrum meltdown attacks. And um, our newly discovered attack pretty much bypasses all known mitigation mechanisms implemented, implemented in response to Spectrum meltdown. Now, what makes this research into these attacks cutting edge compared to uh, cyber attacks against more traditional vulnerabilities is that it gets to the root of how modern, modern CPUs uh, basically operate. Now, addressing this vulnerability is extremely challenging and creating mit uh, mitigation mechanisms is highly complex and can hamper pretty much, uh, pretty much hamper performance uh, uh, achieved by speculative execution features. Now, uh, for example, um, uh, completely el eliminating the possibility of side channel attacks against uh, the speculative execution functionality uh, of Intel CPUs would require a complete uh, disabling of hyperthreading, which would seriously degrade performance. So let's face it, who, who is willing to disable hyperthreading, especially in a multi-cloud or uh, highly, highly virtualized infrastructure or data center? Um, we also worked clo closely with Microsoft, which developed and published a patch, um, and some other vendors in the ecosystems have also been involved. Of course, this was a joint effort because you know, it affected much more than just hardware. It also affected the software that stayed on top of that hardware. Um, uh, again, while deploying the patch that Microsoft provided is highly recommended, we also uh, demonstrated how hypervisor intros introspection, one of our own technologies, uh, can actually uh, stop the attack by uh, removing the condition uh, it needs to succeed on unpatched Windows systems. Um, since most cloud, again, since most cloud infrastructures and, um, and data centers run on Intel chips, the implication of these types of vulnerabilities involved, um, of these type of vulnerable, of these types of vulnerabilities um, involve attackers having the ability to extract and ultimately exfiltrate sensitive information such as uh, password, um, encryption keys, um, tokens, or even access credentials uh, that may be present in kernel uh, memory without actually leaving any traces within the operating system. But again, that, I know I, I digress a, a little bit, but uh, that said, now you know um, why we started uh, this landscape report with, uh, with vulnerabilities. Both software and hardware vulnerabilities can have a serious effect, uh, effect on your uh, infrastructure and ultimately on your um, uh, business continuity, if you will. Uh, moving on to threats. Uh, the global evolution of malware um, pretty much indicates that it has increased both in numbers and sophistication. And if our own telemetry might be uh, subject subjective, if you will, in proving that, uh, stats from AV tests uh, actually paint a really nice and clear picture of how uh, the number of threats uh, have evolved, not just over the past couple of years, for each operating system, um, but also how they have evolved during the first half of 2019. Um, those of you interested um, uh, are more than welcome to check out uh, their uh, AV test website and click on the 2019 column to check out a monthly evolution of threats. You can pretty much go back in time and see how malware reports have increased on a monthly basis. Now, as an interesting fact, um, they have an average, if, I, if my memory serves, of about 5.5% increase in the number of reported, vulnerability, uh, reported malware samples during the first six months of 2019. And um, I calculated that this roughly translates in about 48 million samples. Now, bit of telemetry reflects a slightly higher trend, uh, about 6.6, 6.7. Uh, in terms, uh, at least in terms of increase when, it come, when comparing the year-over-year -year number of malware reports, uh, which means somewhere closer to 49 to 50 million malware samples. Now, this is actually not that big of a difference, but it does mean um, that what they see, what AB test sees in terms of evolution in numbers at a global industry scale, we can also confirm as an individual uh, security vendor. 
And this pretty much means that uh, the trends that we usually uh, provide in these threat landscape reports are you know, on par with, uh, with the industry standard. Now, looking at these charts, what's, based on, what's the first thing that comes to mind? This is uh, something that I usually um, ask everybody that I put in face of this. Uh, I put these slides in face of. Uh, to me, um, uh, to me is uh, basically a, a, a single question, and that question is, uh, what motivates threat actors to write and spread uh, so much malware? And since um, no one does anything pretty much without getting their return on investment, the answer is actually quite simple, money. But <laughs> there's another follow-up question. Um, is there anything else that cyber criminals uh, love more besides money? Well, actually, and not to anyone's surprise, there is uh, more money. Now, the reason for this slide is actually pretty, uh, is that it pretty much sums up what we've seen in terms of, uh, in terms of threat landscape. Now, Despite the fall of GANCRAB, uh, the number of ransomware reports targeting businesses has steadily increased uh, during the first half of 2019 with, um, with newer ransomware families filling in the void left behind by GANCRAB. Um, in fact, we've seen an almost 75% increase in the number of ransomware reports year over year, meaning that even if the dominant player in the ransomware market might have gone dark, the uh, ransom business is so lucrative uh, that threat actors immediately um, repurposed other malware families. Uh, in fact, as, um, as I mentioned previously, some new ransomware families have emerged bearing striking uh, similarities to GANCRAB. Uh, so Dino Kibi, also known as um, Revil, uh, as well as Ryuk, are just two new ransomware families that share similarities. Uh, with GANCRAB, similarities that involves every, uh, something along the lines of ransom node, um, file names and extension, even extortion methods, and you know, a lot more. Um, one incident in which ransomware has been found um, uh, targeting critical infrastructure involves the, um, if I remember correctly, the city of New Bedford in the state of Massachusetts, um, which pretty much declined to offer attackers about $5.3 million in order to uh, restore their affected systems. Now, <laughs> ironically, instead, uh, they made a modest counter offer to, uh, to the guys operating that ransomware of about $400,000, which seems uh, to have also been declined by attackers, basically leaving the city scrambling for solutions and fending for themselves. Now, fortunately, IT administrators eventually, um, eventually managed to recover most of the data lost um, by going to, uh, to their backups. Um, if I'm not mistaken, there's also another incident that involves um, an attack on Norsk Hydro, I believe, a Norwegian aluminum and renewable energy company, which occurred in March. It's believed um, operators used Locker Goga. So again, these are just a couple of examples in which, although the, uh, the GAN Crab ransomware family that accounted for over 50% of the ransomware uh, market, although that uh, Gantra, you know, has retired, mostly claiming that uh, they've made $2 billion in about 18 months of activity, um, you know, the cybercrime industry has quickly adapted and uh, found new ransomware variants to use because, uh, you know, the ransomware business, especially when targeting uh, infrastructures, large infrastructures and companies, is highly, highly lucrative. Uh, ransomware, uh, cryptocurrency miners, fileless malware, and even exploits and web-based exploit kits are basically the main threats that have been targeting organizations, regardless of their size, big and small. Uh, in terms of threats uh, gunning for um, organizations, um, making a growing, if you will, trend in the realm, uh, realm of ransomware, uh, 2019, I mean, the first half of 2019 saw a spike, a spike in uh, attacks targeting critical infrastructure and government institutions, just like the two examples I mentioned uh, previously. Uh, ransomware operators uh, did not discriminate, um, and ransomware strains like Loker, Gag, uh, Loker Goga, uh, Ryuk, and uh, Sodino Kibi, uh, which are basically spin-offs of the notorious GANCRAB, these made most of the headlines in ransomware incident news in the first half of 2019. Now, 
the most targeted verticals actually range from uh, education, government, critical infrastructure, you know, like the water distribution and power distribution plants, uh, healthcare and services, all the way to uh, MSPs, uh, managed service providers, um, whose offerings based offerings usually include cybersecurity uh, services for a wide portfolio of clients. Now, this means that while the extension, again, while the extension of one of the most prolific ransomware families might have been celebrated by both law enforcement and uh, the security industry, the emergence of new families that share uh, some of its similarities make um, business targeting ransomware more resilient than ever before. At the same time, this doubling down and refocusing of efforts from the cyber criminal community means that the ransomware market is actually more mature and more versatile than ever before. So this means that if uh, until now we believe that taking down the, one of the largest uh, ransomware families would basically disrupt cyber criminal operations, now that we have more than one ransomware family going after businesses and all being used at the same time, you know, it's going to make it a lot more difficult for law enforcement and security vendors to dismantle these operations. Um, oh, and since we've mentioned, mentioned exploits, it's probably obvious by now that uh, it's one of the top five threats. In fact, um, about 49% of the top four reported uh, threats involve exploits that have been detected either through uh, our web security technologies that detect um, web-based exploit kits or via um, other security layers from our security stack. Um, although during the next couple of slides, we'll go into some details and see exactly how some of these threats have evolved. Um, we've also prepared a couple of bonus stats and reports um, that you'll hopefully find interesting. So bear with me for the next couple of minutes because uh, it just might be that those stats might not make it in the final report that we're, you're going to be uh, getting in the next couple of days after this webinar. In terms of uh, Bitdefender reports um, regarding the monthly distribution of ransomware, uh, at least ransomware targeting organizations, uh, threat actors have steadily intensified their attacks uh, using new or even um, revamped ransomware families. Um, all of this in the fall of Gantra. Now, from January through June 2019, um, uh, popular ransomware families that have been proven effective in the past have constantly been used against organizations. Uh, everything from CryptoLocker, uh, Locker, Goga, um, Ryuk, uh, Sadino Kibi, uh, all the way to Zepto, Locky, um, Server, if I'm not mistaken, and even uh, WannaCryptor have been reported by Bitdefender Telemetry. Uh, with almost, basically with almost 300 ransomware families currently at their disposal, basically threat actors have constantly made, made use of at least well, at least 15 um, of the most popular ones, popular ransomware families. And um, the stats on screen pretty much show that even if a massive ransomware uh, family is taken offline, again, it doesn't really make a dent in the overall ransomware evolution targeting businesses and, um, and organizations. Um, as most files malware um, uh, pretty much leverages PowerShell or uh, Visual Basic scripts embedded in spear phishing emails, uh, threat actors mostly use it as um, a first line of attack, if you will, whose purpose is to um, probe and assess the system for security solutions and then either broadcast specific information to a CNC, command and control server, or um, even download additional malicious components. Now, because it's so effective in stealth, it's easy to understand why attackers um, are really not going to give it up uh, anytime soon. This is um, this in turn actually causes security concern for security professionals that do <laughs> in lead them, if you will, to sometimes disable PowerShell and Microsoft Office macros in an attempt to, um, uh, to swat any potential threats. Um, fileless malware has become a constant nuisance for organizations, um, and it's usually the most common attack vectors, uh, usually part of um, spam emails. Um, uh, a common attack vector is that uh, yield successful results in terms of infiltrating and um, actually deploying malicious payloads, while at the same time dodging traditional security solutions. Um, this pretty much means that the increased number of reports regarding fileless, um, uh, fileless threats targeting businesses throughout the first half of 2019 basically proves um, that the, um, all the dodge, uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, pretty much remains true because we've seen fileless threats uh, the same files uh, threats um, uh, growing in our previous threat, uh, threat landscape reports from 2018, both the first half and the second half. 
Um, another recent threat that uh, was developed with the um, with the specific need to generate profit, if you will, is actually crypto jacking. Now, cryptocurrency miners may have started as a consumer nuisance, but uh, eventually ended up affecting businesses as well by going after computing intensive um, cloud infrastructures. Now, while the number of businesses and organizations, um, uh, while a number of businesses and organizations have been affected by cryptocurrency miners being deployed in their cloud, um, most don't actually even consider it a threat because you know it's seemingly benign. Now, however, um, um, a crypto jacking infection within an organization should be treated as a data breach uh, because if attackers managed to uh, stealthily deploy and install something seemingly as benign as a cryptocurrency miner, they could have also had access to other resources uh, such as um, uh, intellectual property, uh, classified documents, and and so on. Uh, the cryptocurrency miner um, uh, could simply be, if you will, a means of uh, making some extra revenue on the side after actually achieving their primary, uh, primary uh, data exploitation goals. Um, uh, Bitdefender telemetry in business environments shows that, um, uh, shows that cryptocurrency miner reports have also int uh, intensified um, after seemingly plateauing during the first couple of months of 2019, specifically uh, in January and February. Um, uh, while most crypto jacking attempts involve a web-based component, such as a um, compromised website that an employee visits, uh, some reports actually involve attempts at actual cryptocurrency mining clients being installed on endpoints, uh, may they be physical or uh, virtual. Uh, now, as a bonus for sticking with us uh, throughout the webinar so far, just as, uh, just as we promised, um, we've also got a couple of slides, interesting slides, um, uh, containing some interesting threats. Well, technically it's tagged as a threat, but more in the lines of grayware, uh, grayware than actually malware. Of course, I'm talking about potentially unwanted applications. Um, just like crypto jackers, um, seemingly benign, I mean, uh, they, these also have made quite an interesting mark during the first half of 2019, as um, interestingly it accounted for around 79 to 80 percent of the top global windows threats reported um, and almost uh, 90 to 95 percent of all global mac os threats reported now pua potentially unwanted applications um, these are actually considered grayware because uh, they walk a fine line between malware and legitimate adverse services now some recent bit of investigations um, uh, researching three advanced adware campaigns have actually uh, put some spyware to shame. Uh, if memory serves, uh, Zachinlo, uh, Stranos, and um, Is Erlk, I think, pack some unique features and cap uh, capabilities that even enable um, uh, rootkeep capabilities, allowing attackers to uh, basically fully manage infected systems. Now, <laughs> for instance, uh, so some of these actually featured rootkit drivers that protected themselves as well as their, uh, as well as uh, some other components that they had even giving um, uh, the adware the ability to stop, to stop processes if they were deemed dangerous to the functionality of the adware. Um, another one extracted cookies, for example, and even stole login credentials from popular browsers, uh, such as um, Google Chrome, Chromium, Firefox, um, Opera, uh, Microsoft Edge, Internet Expo Explorer, Baidu browser, Yandex browser, and pretty much every uh, popular browser out there. Now, some even packed different types of code encryption surrounded by meaningless data uh, in order to avoid static analysis and detection. Again, these are just some of the capabilities that we found in, again, adware, potentially unwanted application. So that's why the uh, grayware line, and that's why they, uh, I mentioned that they walk a fine line between malware and adware. Uh, anyway, it's probably clear uh, by now that organizations need to also factor in adware in their security policy and, um, and perhaps even set up and deploy strict application whitelisting policies that uh, prevent employees from downloading and installing potentially uh, unwanted applications. Now, moving on to the, um, to the second surprise, the second surprise stats. Um, <laughs> although it might not be too obvious from the name of the chart, um, uh, we're going to be talking about IOTs, specifically industrial IOTs. Now, in terms, in terms of industrial IOTs 
and uh, pretty much overall smart things that may be part of an organization's network, uh, threat actors may abuse vulnerabilities in these devices to tamper, to tamper with um, critical infrastructure equipment or even use them as gateways within uh, the organization. However, uh, some attacks may even be more insidious um, and involve uh, creating panic by turning, uh, turning down power grids or by destroying industrial equipment. Uh, uh, if you guys remember TRISIS, you know, the TRISIS malware discovered uh, earlier this year, uh, which has been uh, tagged as the world's most dangerous malware, was actually intended to cause um, uh, physical destruction by targeting industrial safety systems. Now, Triton serves, served um, as something of a wake-up call, if you will, uh, because, it's potentially, uh, because it's potential to cause massive destruction in the form of an emergency at an oil and gas plant was massive. Um, by the way, the vast majority of vulnerabilities involving IOTs and even industrial IOTs um, revolve around the lack uh, or even poor authentication uh, when it comes to remotely dialing in and controlling these devices. Now, now industrial IOTs are even worse at this <laughs> as they were uh, initially, designed, initially designed to accept uh, parameters and instructions by having engineers directly connecting to them via uh, serial ports, meaning uh, authentication was not necessary if the person was already authorized to be in the proximity of such devices. Now, all that changed when serial to Ethernet adapters uh, were introduced, pretty much enabling engineers to remotely configure these, uh, these devices. Uh, some of the most common services usually exposed to the internet by, um, uh, by these devices uh, pretty much involve Telnet, SSH, uh, UPnP, and even, um, even UDP ports. Um, uh, these are actually ports common to both IoTs and sometimes even industrial IoTs. Now, uh, Bitdefender has actually deployed a series of honeypots uh, mimicking the behavior of such vulnerable ports and um, connected them to the internet to be probed by IoT malware and threat actors. Now, now the purpose of deploying honeypots is basically twofold. It both helps uh, security researchers assess the size and scope and a potential botnet that attempts to amass IoT devices by, um, uh, by leveraging a uh, specific vulnerability, and at the same time, gain access to potentially new malware samples that have not yet been reported in the wild. Now, these valuable pieces of intelligence can help security researchers both learn more about the tactics um, and why not even the, tools, even the tools used by cyber criminals when compromising devices, while at the same time, understanding the motives of their operations. Now, Bitdefender Honeypot telemetry from the first half of 2019 shows that attackers have successfully compromised the Telnet port uh, more than 7.73 million times uh, using a combination of username and password. Um, while this process is usually you know, pretty much automated and left to scripts that either um, brute force or try, to com or try out um, commonly used username and passwords, it does show that the Telnet port is actively being scanned for by, um, by IoT malware and threat actors. Um, also, as a result of successfully compromising our honeypots, um, um, these, our honeypots were actually instructed by CNC servers to perform over 196,000 attacks on various infrastructures and services. So that's about 200,000 uh, 2, attacks. In fact, some, um, some of the most targeted infrastructures and services toward which these attacks were directed, directed were actually hosted by Amazon, uh, Comcast, and even Microsoft, hence uh, what you're seeing in the slide in front of you. Uh, while our honeypots, uh, you know, a, a small disclosure, uh, while our honeypots actually um, never participated in any of these uh, attacks on, on these infrastructures, um, they only received instructions to do so. But it was interesting to see um, who attackers were actually targeting. Uh, so it's likely these attacks were not intentionally directed at Amazon per se, uh, but rather towards services hosted by the cloud service provider. Um, after being successfully infiltrated, uh, our Bitdefender honeypots were also instructed to download uh, various files ranging from um, scripts, from malware, and even executable files. Uh, summing up over, um, if I'm not mistaken, 14.3 million artifacts. Now, this means that threat actors were not only trying to get into devices, but also ensure consistency by deploying um, tools or even malware 
uh, or additional malware uh, designed to ensure a foothold or even move laterally across the network to find and even compromise other potential, uh, potential devices. Um, now, with the help of these honeypots, we were also able to infiltrate hundreds of IoT botnets and see the type of the types of infrastructure uh, instructions they would receive. Um, also, we were able to see where their command and control servers were located and potentially learn how massive those bots, botnets uh, really are. Um, and it's interesting to see that um, that all of our honeypots actually uh, changed ownership a couple of a couple of uh, times a day. So this pretty much means that there are quite a few. So there, there are quite a few malware, IoT malware uh, out there, and that uh, the actual number of compromised devices that belong to a specific botnet may vary in size largely from one day to the next. Now, this evolving threat landscape means that um, uh, both security solutions uh, and organizations, um, regardless of their size and industry vertical, need to focus on preventing uh, both known and sophisticated malware, uh, but also on detecting the truly advanced threats that specifically gun for their organizations. Now, these are commonly known as the uh, last 1%, but they're also known as advanced persistent threats, or APTs. Uh, well, while um, our threat landscape report doesn't include any investigations uh, on APTs, uh, because we usually address these uh, individually through uh, reports, um, uh, I do encourage everyone to check out our, our labs.bitdefender.com websites if you want to read more uh, on, these, uh, on these reports and how these APTs actually operate and for how long um, advanced cyber criminals or advanced groups of cyber criminals uh, can stay hidden within an infrastructure. So there's, a, there's actually a really nice paper on Carbonac, an investigation that we did on a financial institutions where we found some really interesting uh, stuff uh, from how long it took them to compromise the critical asset within the infrastructure to how long they actually moved um, within the compromised financial institution in which endpoints they targeted, specifically targeted. Um, these are just a couple of examples that we've investigated over time. Again, you can find them um, on uh, labs.bitdefender.com. And uh, the common feature that they all share is that they're all unique, either um, in attack vector, uh, use tools, and even persistency and uh, capabilities. Now, identifying these threats is no small task for uh, organizations. Um, and while, um, on the one hand, large businesses may have the ability to uh, flex, if you will, their cybersecurity budgets and invest in cybersecurity teams and building their own internal SOCs, uh, security operation centers. Um, SMBs are usually constrained by both the lack of budget and qualified personnel. Now, uh, uh, in fact, about 72% uh, of security professionals actually believe that not having the right tools and knowledge are actually the main obstacles for preventing rapid incident response. Um, uh, again, uh, these are all. This is actually a statistic that we've um, we've included in one of our surveys. We commissioned the surveys that's entitled "Hacked Off," and uh, it's also got some great insights regarding the challenges organizations face in dealing with these uh, with these threats. Now, um, now as a solution, if you will, to addressing these uh, these APTs, some organizations choose outsourcing some of their security challenges to to MSPs, for instance which is usually considered an appealing, an appealing option, especially since it's been proven to keep, um, to keep uh, operational costs low, while at the same time ensuring that incident response times are timely and breach uh, detection is within, if you will, industry standards. But again, uh, this places a huge burden on MSPs um, who, who now also need to have complete visibility into a wide range of environments, uh, ranging from physical to virtual to cloud-based and on-premise, uh, while at the same time dealing with a shortage caused by a lack of qualified personnel. And, and, and this actual problem, the lack of qualified personnel, isn't going away as the um, uh, cybersecurity workforce gap is estimated to reach, uh, I believe, 1.8 million by 2022. Now, um, now, another option for an organization facing these cybersecurity challenges and advanced threats, or APTs, is um, turning to MDR, which, are, which stands for Managed Detection and Response Services, which is basically an outsourced uh, SOC, if you will, 
um, mostly comprised of security analysts that monitor uh, detailed telemetry and, and quickly and effectively respond to malicious, uh, malicious activities. Now, they, they actively remove threats and reduce dwell time, pretty much limiting any, any, any damage to the uh, organization. Um, now, these services would defend against much more than just garden variety threats that I previously mentioned, but also defend against um, modern threats and advanced attacks, uh, the, like of, the likes of which um, you have seen in this slide. Um, summing up everything we've discussed so far, um, if I am to leave you with a couple of key takeaways from this webinar, um, these would be it. Uh, vulnerabilities in your infrastructures uh, may be unpatchable, um, either because of legacy software issues or because of hardware vulnerabilities that require um, a complete uh, teardown and re uh, replacement with new hardware. Uh, of course, the latter may not be the case, either because of um, you know, skyrocketing costs or even because there's simply no new hardware available that addresses um, those vulnerability concerns. Uh, ransomware reports have increased by almost 75% uh, year over year. Um, and while one of the biggest players in the uh, ransomware market, uh, GANCRAB, has retired, uh, it left a power vacuum that was quickly filled by new ransomware families. Now, again, um, uh, just as an emphasis, uh, this new fragmentation means um, the ransomware industry is now more resilient to takedowns by law enforcement and cybersecurity vendors, pretty much raising um, new challenges for organizations in terms of protecting uh, against them. As our uh, honeypot telemetry shows, IoTs and industrial IoTs that expose uh, vulnerable ports and um, even poor authentication methods all of these to the internet are um, actively being targeted. And finally, because all of these threats and security, because of all these threats and security challenges, 49% um, of information security professionals lose sleep over their organization's um, cybersecurity readiness when dealing with attacks. Oh, I guess that's it on my side, uh, at least for now. Um, again, as a um, reminder, the final report we're planning to release in the next couple of, um, uh, we're planning to release in the next couple of days includes far more telemetry and insights into both uh, consumer and business threats um, and will uh, probably follow up uh, with an email uh, to all of you that attended this webinar uh, linking um, the final version of the threat landscape report um, some of that uh, information in that report will include some a split between consumer and business threats, so it probably will, uh, will also be interesting for um, both the average user as well as to InfoSec professionals. Uh, with that said, thank you for listening, um, and let's see if we have any, any questions. Kasmin? Uh, thank you, Livio. Uh, great insight so far. Uh, just a quick reminder, uh, everyone attending, uh, don't forget to use the chat and submit any questions that you might have. Uh, Livio, in the meantime, uh, we got a question about the recording. The question is, uh, will the recording be available later? So uh, I guess you just mentioned that we're going to send out the report as well. In the follow-up email, we are going to include the link uh, for you guys to directly access the recording. Uh, on top of that, uh, all our uh, webinars are published on demand on uh, our webinars page on bitfinder.com. And this session will become available on demand uh, starting next week. Uh, Livio, we got a quick question about ransomware. Uh, the question is, does Bitdefender pro protect against ransomware? Uh, actually, yeah, that is, um, we do protect against ransomware. We have several um, uh, layers, um, security layers in the security stack and the technology stack that we currently employ on both uh, endpoints and uh, cloud environments, you know, physical and virtual environments. And um, uh, again, uh, protecting against ransomware is all about, you know, uh, taking the proper measures to protect uh, as you would uh, against any other threat. You know, you, you rely on the security solution to detect uh, even new ransomware strands, but at the same time, since your valuable information um, is targeted, you might consider backup solutions and uh, incremental backups, if you will, that, um, you know, in case um, uh, the security solution misses the ransomware protection, you can also restore uh, your data. But to answer specifically to your question, yes, Bitdefender does have uh, one of the best detections against ransomware, and uh, you can check out independent tests like AB tests or AB uh, comparatives 
that will give you, uh, you know, a pretty accurate view of um, our track record, if you will, in terms of defending against threats. Uh, thank you, Livio. Uh, questions are coming in. Uh, the next question is, uh, are you aware of any good automatic patch management solution? Actually, yes, um, I am aware, and it's called, uh, and it's actually included in Bitdefender. <laughs> we have an automated patching solution. So um, as part of uh, Bitdefender Gravity, you know, we do have the Bitdefender Gravity Zone, if you will, umbrella that also includes a patch management module. So um, uh, go ahead, test it out for yourself whenever it will detect that you, uh, you have unpatched software or that there is a patch available for a specific version of Java, Adobe, or any other application that you might be using within your infrastructure on your endpoints. Uh, it will let you know, uh, and you can choose to deploy it uh, or not. But again, <laughs> as a small uh, word of caution, whenever you deploy patches, uh, please test it on a, a small number of environments to make sure that it doesn't break compatibility, you know, backwards compatibility with applications and software, uh, legacy applications and software that you might have. Uh, thank you, Livio. Uh, the next question is, uh, for small businesses, uh, do I need to get a specific uh, solution? Um, uh, it depends. We also have um, uh, specific offerings for SMBs. Uh, you can uh, actually contact one of our representatives if you want more details uh, on exactly what you, your organization might need. So feel free to email us and uh, we'll put you in contact with somebody from, um, from our teams that will, you know, give you something specifically tailored for uh, your organization and uh, if not infrastructure. Uh, thank you, Liv. Uh, the next question is, uh, will there ever be future webinars about uh, your console admin? <laughs> this is not something that's uh, within my uh, area of expertise. I mostly deal with um, uh, threat, threats, malware, research and investigations, but I, I think it's something that uh, you can, uh, we can uh, bring up to Cosme and, and see if we can plan something ahead. Yeah, certainly, Liv. Uh, Michael, to add to that, uh, we send out invites on a regular basis for our webinars. So keep an eye open in your inbox for future webinar invites. Uh, also, we publish all our webinars on uh, the webinars page on bdefender.com. And furthermore, we're going to add that on the wish list for future sessions. If you, uh, these were all the questions for today. We're on top of the session. Uh, thank you very much for presenting today. Thank you everyone for attending and don't forget to stay tuned for more webinars. Thank you, Cosmin, for having us and everyone have a lovely day. Cheers.